Hi everyone, thank you for uh, coming and thank you for inviting me here, uh, Beatriz. Uh, <coughs> so the talk, uh, before starting the talk, I want to know how many of you already know how is your life going to be in, let's say, five years, ten years? You have a plan for five years, ten years? No. Okay, just good. <laughs> <coughs> so I, I just want to say that when I was in your position, I didn't really know that I was going to be here uh, several years later in, in another place doing something different. And, and that's, how, that's something I want to share with you today about my journey, about the, what I do now and why I'm here. <coughs> so I have this title in Spanish, El Reto de Crear Soluciones de Ingeniería en Ambientes Sociotécnicos. That's the title that would be in Spanish. But I, I, I have it in Spanish because I, I want you to feel what I felt the, same, the first time I started to, to attend a talk that was in a different language than me. How many of you speak a different language that is not English? <coughs> how, many you, how many of you want to learn more about a, or a second language? <coughs> that will give you an advantage, an advantage uh, in regards of your possibilities of connecting with other people in the world. And for me, it's the opportunity to be here that I have a, a different language. I, I really think that that helps a lot. But I want to tell you more about this. Um, this is working now, it's not working. It should work. Yeah. Um, it's safe, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. Is it working? It's no, it's not. <coughs> anyway, I I can use. Okay, so the title in English is the challenge of creating engineering solutions. Sometimes you get nervous and you shut it off. <laughs> okay, <coughs> the challenge of creating so engineering solutions in sociotechnical environments. What are the skills that engineers need to successfully intervene in organizations? And how can we teach for those? Those are kind of the questions I had. I have had my when I started to work in industry, and and then I will tell you more about how did I get these questions. But it's kind of what moves me forward when I am thinking in research or when I'm thinking in come here to teach and and help my students to get better at addressing those problems or, or getting better at problem solving. Who am I? I'm from Colombia. Uh, this is a typical hat from Colombia. This, this, this picture was here in, in the United States. I use the hat because I like uh, that component of my life. I am from Colombia. Colombia is in South America in the north, and this is Florida. As you see, it's very close now. But I was in Indiana when I came here. Uh, it's a very cold place for me. Uh, I am a cisgender male. I, my favorite pronouns are he, his, and him. And as, as I said, I'm from Bogota, Colombia. Something interesting that we, that I realized when I came is that in Colombia, we don't have seasons as you have here. So we talk about when winter for us is the wet season and summer for us is the dry season. And that's all. But when I came here and in summer, it was raining. I was like, hmm, why is it raining in summer? So I, I got a different perspective of what seasons mean, more related to temperature here in the United States. So that's, a, that's a another thing that I wanted to share. I am from Bogota in the mountains where the temperatures vari variates between, in one day between, in your language, in Fahrenheit would be between the 40s and 50s to the 70s in one day every day, the whole year. So it's kind of that temperature the whole, the whole time. Um, I started at Universidad Nacional de Colombia. That's where I studied my bachelor's degree. I am a first generation college, meaning that my father didn't finish middle school. My mother didn't finish elementary school. And all I, uh, I have brothers and my, uh, my oldest brother is 20 years older than me. He finishes his uh, bachelor's degree, and my sister finished 
uh, then I have a sister who didn't complete middle school or high school and then another uh, sister that graduated in his ba her bachelor's degree studying the night after I graduated from the school and then I have another brother who studied and graduated from the bachelor's and then it was me. Still I feel like I, I was a uh, first generation college especially because nobody told me what was it to be in a university. Nobody told me like you can go to these resources, you can go to student organizations, you can be part of the different activities in the university for promoting your or like to get a better skills in all the different things that the university has to offer and also internships or things like that. I, wa I was discovering that in, in the past. So this, this I graduated and then I went straight to industry. I uh, saw so in, in Colombia and in many places you, fin you end your bachelor's degree and then you go to industry. Maybe it's a way to get a better uh, s social mobility in some, some ways. But when I was in industry, I started to realize that sometimes we struggle a lot with the different things that happen in industry. I was working with different clients, with different companies. So I worked with Unisys Colombia, which uh, was uh, doing consultant work with the different uh, uh, entities in Colombia. So Función Pública is a government uh, industry. Seguros Bolívar is an insurance company and with three banks, Banco Popular, Banco Santander, Banca Fe. They, those are, were uh, projects that Unisys were doing at that time there. And in those projects, I realized that the customer was different and there were stakeholders with different interests. And sometimes it was really difficult to navigate the complexity of addressing the needs of different customers. They, you cannot really say that you understand what they need or what they want unless you do something with them. Or So I, at that time it was really like a position of, of facing the client instead of talking with the client. And we in the position of engineers, sometimes we believe that we know the truth and the users don't know what they want, so we want to impose our solutions or in the projects. And that's something that I learned when I was there, and I was wondering how can we get better as engineers to do something uh, or to help our customers better. I was working also in two more companies, one called Informatica Siglo XXI, also working as consultant for Banco Popular, and in, the, in Mazda, in the Colombian uh, subsidiary for Mazda. I was working in Mazda because I was in a program in which uh, Mazda paid my, my, my magister, my master's degree. So I was half time studying, half time working, and it was a great deal for me. So when I went there, I, so as I said, I was doing my master's in systems and computer engineering on Universidad de Los Andes. So I graduated from Universidad Nacional, which is the best public university in Colombia and, and the best one and then Universidad de Los Andes, which is the best private university in Colombia. And it was a re real great deal for me to be there and to be able to be uh, in these universities. And, and then with the master, instead of closing my questions with the, of my work in industry, I started to open more questions on, on how can I contribute better to my students? How can I be better at helping my students or helping people to learn how to navigate the complexity of creating solutions. In that case, in that, at that time, it was software solutions for companies, for industry. And that's why I became faculty. Faculty meaning that I wanted to contribute to you, to your society. And then I was faculty in, so I started at Universidad Católica de Colombia as a lecturer. Uh, I taught community informatics, systems thinking, and a research seminar. In those, uh, I was working with customers or with real customers, or, and systems thinking was helping my students to develop the ability to see beyond uh, the linearity or the reductionism that sometimes engineers have. Still, I moved to, or I was hired by another university in Colombia, very important, as Universidad Javeriana, which is the second private university in Colombia. 
And then I taught different courses in systems thinking again and research seminar, social responsibility for informatic projects. I always was connected to people and trying to think like how we as engineers can be better for our stakeholders, which are the people who are using our products, right? And, and in that way, I was connected to design and, and how can we, can we create that we design solutions for people. Participative design was something that started to, uh, well, I, that started in my mind when I was in the masters and then I, I, working as a faculty helped me to find more questions and those, the answers to those questions were not available. We're not in books, we're not in Wikipedia, we're not in anywhere. S uh, so I, I had the opportunity to come here to do my PhD in engineering education. I was looking, I looked for several years a PhD. The normal pathway for people in my field was to go to do a PhD in informatics or in computer science or maybe in, yeah, mainly in computer science because the background for me in systems and computer engineering is that you learn how to create software solutions for organizations and how to make them more effective. And the normal path there is to do a PhD, if you want to do a PhD, to do a PhD in engineering in, in computer science. But in my case, I, I was more in the educational field. I wanted to contribute more and understand better my students, better how can I promote some, that kind of learning that I, that I explain you. So when you decide to go to these kind of schools, like doing, some, sometimes you don't really know if you want to do a master's, a PhD, what is the difference, what is, but in my case, what I realize now, I didn't know that at the time. When I did the masters, I thought I choose between a um, specialization or a masters. And for me, it was the same in the balance. The only difference was that when I thought in the specialization, uh, three years later, I need to take another certification because the previous product has already expired. And then three years later, I have to take another certification to recertify me. But in the masters, I was more like, well, I don't have to do another master's to show that I have my master's degree. So I want to go for the master's. That was my main reason at the time. Now I feel that I had those questions and the master helped me to understand better my questions. And then when I felt that I didn't have the answers for those questions, that's when I came to do the PhD. So in the PhD, you want to pursue an answer to questions that you have, the fundamental questions you have in a topic that you like. So, uh, so that's why I came to Purdue. Oh, I got married when I was at the, uh, the University of Havariana, and that was a happy moment in my life. And uh, I bring in that because as professional, you are also have other dimensions in your, and your family is, uh, is important for me. That's why I'm here. So I, I, I was working on professional skills since the moment I was there teaching and developing professional skills in my students. And I was always, uh, since I was working uh, uh, in professional internships and community engagement projects and graduation projects, I always was in design and, in, and developing solutions for real people, professional skills that everyone needs whenever you are going to industry. So, I came, I had the opportunity and I have to apply. It's, it's a long process to decide. Since the moment you decide to do a PhD and then you decide to do it and then it takes like one or two years to get in and to start. So it's a process of patience and process of getting ready because at least for us, uh, we have to take the TOEFL exam, which is a way to show that we have a good, a good communication skills in English, and then you have to do the GRE as well as you. And so for us, it's two exams that you have to prepare. Um, I was talking with someone uh, at Purdue University one day, and he told me 
Well, uh, you have a big competence and the only way and it's, uh, a professor should know about your capability to perform well in the PhD and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big investment that he's going to do in, yourself, in, in you, right? The, the mentor, the advisor is going to invest a lot of money in you. So how can he know that, that you are good? You are coming from a different country. So they, these exams are the only way they say that we can compare. The only difference is that in Colombia, we don't have access to too many resources. So we may take like one, two or three uh, simulation exams. Uh, people from other countries, maybe China, India, they take like 20 simulations before taking the real exam. And in that way, they get better prepared for those exams. <coughs> so it's a matter of resources. It's a matter of how can you train for those exams. And here is, it would be the same for, for you. If you want to apply, you need to train. Because those exams is not only about knowing, but also about training for those exams. You are more trained than I am because you are taking like the different, uh, so my daughter is now in elementary and she's always tested like every three weeks maybe for with standard exams and knowing how she's doing compared with other students and everything like that in, a, in our time that was not there. So we needed to train more in the taking of exams and get more used to that. And still, I was ap approved to be in the PhD for engineer in engineering education. I was lucky. Uh, I say lucky uh, because well, I, many people apply and I was selected. So, <coughs> so I, get, I get there with one question. How can we teach students to be better when creating solutions for real world customers? Always like how can we teach you to be better at that? So uh, when I was in the PhD, my daughter came to our lives. I was so happy, and uh, if I think that that keeps me moving forward and always trying to think. My wife and my daughter has been very important for me. That's why I always bring her to my presentations. Because <laughs> so otherwise, uh, I don't really think I have accomplished all. So I, the research question I had, how the ability to create effective engineering solutions for open-ended problems in complex socio-technical systems can be effectively taught? As you see, the question was more um, elaborated now, has more specific uh, words. That's something that happens while, while you start working with problems, with open-ended problems. When you work with open-ended problems, you don't really know at the beginning anything about some area and it's a big problem. And then when you read and then uh, you got more language, you got more specificity on something, it got better for you in, in order to create um, better definition and allows you to go forward to find a solution. So I, I was there. And then I started to see, yeah. <coughs> so I was at Purdue University, had the opportunity to be part of teaching uh, in the EPICS program, in the first year engineering program, and being instructor of record in the first year engineering program was a big responsibility. And I, I work uh, very hard to make my students uh, happy and my boss is happy and my advisor happy there. It was, it was a time in which I was very busy. And then I realized I found with my classes and with my teaching there that for being effective, you need to define very clearly a learning goal for students and then create a curriculum that has a content assessment and pedagogy and that curriculum should be aligned. I learned that in one specific class uh, that is um, content assessment and pedagogy class. And with uh, Rudy Strebler, Shanae Kursai, I name I mean, then in case they watch the video. <laughs> and then I, I found that one piece that is very important when you are creating a curriculum is the assessment component. Because sometimes you teach in one way and then you do an exam and the exam is not aligned to the, what you taught. And then the students fail in the exam and you think, oh, these students are, no. I don't know why you are failing because I'm giving you all my knowledge. But still it's not that, it's that 
the exam is not aligned with the pedagogy or with the content. So I found that when you do assessment, you need to work on three different uh, <coughs> components, observation, interpretation, and cognition. But I also found that this component here, cognition, is really important uh, for uh, cognition ex explains how people learn that topic, Expr express how people is good, is how people uh, develop that ability or that content. So let's say that a person who doesn't know anything about it has this level here and shows this kind of, of deliverables or evidence when they don't know and a person who knows should show these kind of skills or or evidence of their of the way they know and then you have a different stages for you to, as instructor is really need really important for you to know where your students are and how can you help them to move them forward and that was something really interesting for me i didn't know that there were learning theories, or you have to consider learning theories when developing a curriculum intervention, a class, a course, or anything like that. So I decided that I wanted to learn more about it. And then my research questions have to change. And then what is, and what is it, what is, and how is it learned the ability to create effective engineering solutions. So it's not about me teaching you, but how do you learn that ability? How students or people in general learn that ability? That was another way for me to change the question. Maybe now with more information, I will develop <coughs> uh, teaching strategies, but first I need to know how people learn the ability to be able to create, as I said, this triangle here. So with this component, I, am, I can create assignments, tasks, and then and in the light of the cognition. And then with this task, I can interpret what you create in the light of this learning path that I found or that I am able to um, get a better understanding, right? So as instructors or as professors, you have students who you see uh, that are struggling and sometimes you know, I mean, after several years of, of teaching the same class, you know that they are struggling and then, and you know why and you know where they are, but, and then you can create a theory of difficulty in, in the things that are there. But it's still, there are many topics in which you don't really know exactly or know how students develop that learning and that's why it is important when you are thinking about developing a curriculum. So that's something that was interesting for me and then I started to think, okay, how can I apply or how can I learn about this, but specifically for the topic I want to, my students to develop, I want my students to learn. That was interesting because no one, no one has thought about it before well, has thought, but not in the way I was going to to talk about it. The how can be effectively taught is something I will remove and put it for later. So this is my later now. As faculty, I am going to, so my research and my activities are more like, I need to complete this to be able to do this. And this is where I kind of, So this is the title of my uh, dissertation, a phenomenographic study of the ability to address complex sociotechnical systems via variation theory. Phenomenography because it's the method I use and variation theory is the learning theory I use to explain mm, learning. And what is variation theory? So that's the conceptual framework. I have to go to education and I have to read a lot. Uh, this author, the, the author of variation theory is, Mar is Ferenc Martin and he started to work on phenomenography projects in the 80s, in this, at the end of the 70s. And then with, after several projects, he developed a learning theory that he calls variation theory. The idea is that you learn when you see variation in something. And I will let you know this. So, uh, for example, 
One way in which sometimes we teach, or we, we believe we teach a kid, let's say, we're going to teach a kid about the yellow color, right? So we show him like, oh, this is yellow, and then, oh, this is yellow, and then this is yellow, and then this is yellow. So maybe the kid would say like, okay, yellow is, I mean, what is yellow? So we are expecting the kid to be able to discern that the only thing that is it's the same at the same all the time is the yellow color right and then we say oh yeah it's this this is why you know that this is that this is yellow 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 the other way what martin proposes is that you learn when you perceive difference in a background of sameness and you variate only one dimension and at a time mm -hmm. so what he says is Oh, yellow, 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 yellow. So the kid learns that that's yellow because it's always the same pattern. But the kid will may say, oh, it's a star. He may, he may get confused between a star and yellow, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can incorporate a new dimension of variation, which in this case is color. So you variate only one thing. In this case, color, and then the, the kid, let's say, this is, uh, this he was thinking of in kids, but the challenge is how do you, how do you incorporate some kind of that into our pedagogy? So here, I'm seeing the same shape, but a different color, right? So the kid would say like, oh, there is a difference there. And then you, you have taught about a dimension of variation. The dimension of variation in that case is color. And then when you discern that dimension of variation and then you learn that critical aspect for explaining, in this case, color, right? So that's how he says that you can learn better or easier or how people learn. That you start var variating one thing at a time and you keep this, the others uh, the same. Like when you are uh, let's say playing Mario Kart. You start playing Mario Kart and then you may be just walk, working with the wheels and then you start playing with the different things to see what happens and then you start getting better at that. So he says that you get the dimension of color Opening a new dimension means that you discern a new critical aspect of the object of what you are need to learn, in this case, color. You learn when you learn a new critical aspect or a new critical feature. So he says a feature or a new feature of yellow could be shape or could be different colors. Those are things that he can talk, uh, that he discusses. Any question? Okay, good. <coughs> so this is uh, variation theory says, opening a new dimension of variation to the learner awareness or learn a new feature in one dimension of variation. So a new feature is like, uh, a new dimension of variation is color and then new feature is colors that are in that, so blue, red, yellow. So those are features in the color setting, right? So let's say that you go to the North Pole and then you start walking on the snow. And then uh, for us or for me, the snow is all, always the same color, right? But for a person who lives there in the North Pole, they would see different uh, snow colors. And they would see, because it's related to the deepness of the snow, they are able to see, to, to be aware of the difference. We are not, because we don't see the difference. Like, and then that's how you can understand that, per that perception of awareness of the differences and variation. Systems. So I am a systems engineer and I always thought about systems and systems thinking and how do you develop that ability for others in complex socio-technical systems. So I, I, I want to tell you about different kind of systems. So the, f the first system that you may be aware of are the Goldberg machines, are simple machines in which you have a start and then you see something happening and at the end 
and it's a linear process and it's very normal it's the physics uh, that you see there and it's something that happens all the time the same so the same point of the star same cycle same same i don't know uh, same activities there and then you see an outcome at the end and it's kind of the same right? then you have complicated systems which are computers and and usually you have like uh, different components that are connected to each other or different systems or in this case informatic systems connected to each other to do different tasks and you have an artificial intelligence there and things that are what you have in internet which are complicated systems that are different many many components that together makes something happen right then you have animated systems with our people, like you and me, who make decisions, who don't respond to the same input in the same way, uh, who, are, um, who are different and may respond based on their psychology or their uh, preferences or their own perception of themselves. The social system is composed of many animated systems and and I'm bringing this because I, this is related to the research I was doing. So I was interested in the complex socio-technical systems and teaching my students or teaching people to address the complexity of socio-technical systems. In these socio-technical systems, you have people, you have technology, and all of them are interacting in order to create a product or making your life easier or that's something that engineers do a lot right to create value based on our or the artifacts we create for uh, complex technical systems that are already there and we are trying to make them better easier for them to communicate or better or maybe you have more time more free time because you don't have to go to the bank when i was younger i have to go to the bank to pay the bills now you can do it from your computer now you can do it from your phone it's a way for us to or for engineers to make life of people easier but how but when you create those uh, those solutions that's a very complex system there right so i my research was with people so I, I I am in the engineering education field you work with how people learn so you interview or you work lots with the students with people and work with them to see how can you uh, understand better what they do or what the participants do in order to advance knowledge in this case so I did a research with several uh, professionals <coughs> from Purdue, African Americans, African professionals, Colombian practitioners, uh, uh, one person who was Colombian but has her degrees from Italy, uh, American engineers, uh, faculty, um, people from INCOSI, and INCOSI practitioners. INCOSI is the International Council for Systems Engineering. And <coughs> And the reason why I have this diversity is because for me, being a diverse person, a person from a, a different background, is, is very important to have the voice of everyone in my research, in my studies. So I had people from different um, genders, from different nation ethnicities, and trying to bring the, the voice of everyone into the research study. I also have students uh first years sophomore junior and senior uh, from different towns uh, cities from different professions trying to incorporate also different voices so i don't have a to reduce the bias still 50 percent of my participants were white uh, female and, 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 and male but still white and then the other 50 were uh, latinos and i had only one african-american one african which are different ways to try to bring the voices but it was difficult to find participants as well so trying to do that it was uh, another challenge for me at the time and the findings are <coughs> so i had like a 
different dimensions of variation. So when you do phenomenography, you find different ways in which people experience working, in this case, with complex socio-technical systems. So I had different variation, uh, different dimensions. I tried to create uh, this chart. Uh, different critical aspects here and different ways in which the critical aspects are interacting with each other to create a way people experience addressing those problems. But uh, still, it was uh, uh, a very interesting project and very enlightening for me. I, I just want to make a summary of the results here, just to make sure that is in So I had this here are the critical aspects I found. So as I said, there are critical aspects in, in, in what you need to, to learn. And here I can say one, three, four, five, those are the categories of description, how uh, this critical aspect were together or, and how people uh, in, this, in the different interviews showed their awareness of the critical aspect. So when they talk about the awareness, they talk about the awareness of the, of the whole. And when you get aware of more components of that whole, is when you you are mm, you develop expertise. So yes. when when you ask them, were they all yeah. at the same starting point, or did they? No, it was the problem was about the coffee shop and how everything worked and how they learned how to integrate all the systems. Well, I didn't work with that specific problem, but I work with two tasks, and in one task, I ask my participants to engage on thinking what would they do if they had to create as an emergency response system okay and the other was uh, for t for tornadoes which was a problem that was used before for design yeah and the other one was a problem for like um, um, a manufacturing problem in which a company had to create some kind of product for customers but uh, and then they had also to say how would they address that problem so when i interviewed them then i analyzed those uh, transcripts from them and then i got this matrix here so i found that they think about models, they think about uh, um, the different ecosystemic uh, components of the solution that needs to be taken into account. They talk about the system boundaries, they talk about the time as a factor to be aware of, the considerations of considering the parts versus considering the holes, uh, product tailoring, thinking about the customer how, or what is called like human-centered design and problem rightness, considerations of power, iterative nature of problem solving. Those were the kind of critical aspects that I, if you want to learn more about it, just let me know. But for now, I want to continue just with some, um, with what, what is next for me. So w after finding that, I kind of understand better, better uh, the cognition. I need to continue working on that but as I said, creating a task is now important for me. So what would be an ideal task that I can ask students in the first year or in the second year to address and, and to help them get aware of all, one, two, I don't really know exactly in what level you are right now, or let's say not you, but my students are right now, and what task would be ideal for, or for starting uh, developing those skills or making you aware of those different components. What would be the, the starting point? That's, that's the kind of task I have now. So I have this observation component with the task and create the interpretation as well based on the learning path that I have already found and I may need to iterate more on that. But it's kind of the idea, you don't really have your answer, you have a, a little way to start seeing, hypothesizing what the answer could be and then you have to see, to keep working on the puzzle because that's a puzzle. 
and that's something that could change a little bit, but you are you know, on the process. So when you are in problem solving, there's an iterative process all the time. You never find like the complete solution for something, but you just get a little bit of better understanding of what the problem is. So what are possible learning goals when you are, uh, do you have any questions so far about this or, yeah? Um, so when you're doing the project about um, the emergency response systems, <coughs> what was the, the outcome of your results? So I asked my participants to address that problem and then I recorded what they were and think aloud and then I recorded what they were saying. Like how they are addressing it? Yes. And then I, what I had is like, okay, you talk about customers. And then she also talked about customers. But she never talked about customers. Because that was an example, right? So I, I said, okay, maybe a uh, way is like, you never talk about customers. And then next level is talking about customers. <laughs> That's, that's how I can see that. Or, and then there might be another gray area in which the person maybe mentioned a little bit about customers, but not that much. So it's kind of saying, okay, this is kind of the different features when you talk about customers. Or maybe someone talk about um, the boundaries of the system. And in that case, some people said that the boundary is related to where the system is. I mean like this physical boundary. And some other people talk more about the responsibility of the system. So thinking not only on where the building is, but thinking beyond the, the, the structures, beyond the building. So it's kind of two ways to consider mm -hmm. uh, boundaries. And that's, that's something when you are able to recognize two or three ways, you are more uh, aware of all the different possibilities of thinking about boundaries. So you get, you are, you have more expertise on that. And that's something that you see in experts that they can say like, uh, you have to think about this and this and this, and then they are aware of the different dimensions of variation. So your goal is to possibly learn how to help people to do higher thinking? Is yes. That yes, we, 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 we can say Multi-level, yeah. multi-dimensional. Yes, but not, but mainly help students who are in their first year, second year, third year, because when they go to industry, what, what my experience is when I, when I was uh, in meetings with, uh, I was the coordinator of professional internships, so I met with several uh, supervisors for my students in companies. They usually say that, and I found also that in the closing meetings, uh, they usually say that they don't really, they are not really um, concerned about the students' technical skills, meaning that they all know very much the technical component. But when they go to industry, they lack uh, somehow the ability to perceive or uh, what their contribution to the big picture is. And that is part of what they call the ecosystem in, 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 the, in the, your position. Mm -hmm. So thinking, okay, I'm working in this, but I have these this, this customers, uh, internal customers, and we are contributing to the big picture in this way or the other. That's, that's kind of the idea that you don't have to wait until you get to the universe, to the company or to industry to learn about it, but how can we prepare better our students to deal with that complexity and navigating uh, different stakeholders, requirements, and other things that are their own? Because sometimes when, when you are working in a four-month project, uh, and then the instructors are asking you a lot of requirements, professional requirements, uh, a student may not see the value of that only when they are in industry or something. So it's kind of that component. So like thinking, okay, I'm creating a product for my stakeholders and how can I make stakeholders uh, happy with my product? So I'm, I cannot really create something and give that product to them, 
but I need to involve and work with them and, and incorporate their vision and their, their expectations into my project. That's kind of what I have found and several people always talk about human-centered design and that's what human-centered design is about. Incorporating the per perceptions and the needs of the user into your design and designing with them. So these three ideas were part of what I found. Working collaboratively in diverse teams is very important. It's something that the experts uh, show as very important. Human-centered design, as I said, is very important as well, not only for engineers, uh, but for designers. And I have found, I, I'm teaching now for uh, a class in problem solving for the business school, and I have found that human-centered design is very important there as well because you create products, you always think about marketing for, for people, and you design. Uh, for uh, someone and when you write any any paper you write you are always writing for an audience so you are involved in, and you have to be engaged in human-centered design always thinking how can you make what you create uh, suitable for other people so if you are in science if you are in engineering if you are in any other field human-centered design is very important component and the other thing that they said that the the study show is that uh, if you including systems engineering systems thinking in in the design process is also very important because when you design you don't design for uh, something that is in isolation but you design for uh, addressing a need and then systems thinking allows you to think in the different components that are that your solution is impacting one way or the other always an engineering solution is going to impact the world and that's how we need to engage or to include our systems thinking in the solution development so uh, I had a video but I don't have too much time so I'm going to just say that some challenges on working collaboratively with others are global engineers, diverse teams, and transform the power relationships that we have from vertical to or horizontal. That's another thing that I saw a lot in the conversations with experts. I, I brought here like the voice from experts and, and that's something that was in, in important too, that you, when you are in a leadership position, it is important that you help um, your team and then and then you work with them as equals uh, with different knowledge with different capabilities and they are just helping you to contribute better to any anything user center design a video too but i'm going to skip it the challenge is become a leader and facilitator that help the different stakeholders to agree on what the problem is and how to go about it that's the role as well if you of what the the experts always were thinking about their team about how can we all agree on what the problem is how can we incorporate the community and the different stakeholders in in the team to create a solution that works and that is accepted by the community and as i said stakeholders in problem definition and the design of the solutions that's another thing Systems thinking practices in the design process, use of models, use of simulations to evaluate long-term effects, and uh, stakeholders and interacting systems identification, um, not only in the literature, but also in the field. They always talk about going to the field, to the field and talk to the community, to the people, because the solution is going to impact people and different stakeholders. Continuous improvement, always don't think that you have found the solution and that's all, but you are thinking in long-term projects as well. And that's, uh, I, just, uh, I still have the, the, this grant was closed, but I'm still uh, happy to be funded by this grant uh, for my dissertation or for the end of the dissertation and my postdoc, so. And so thank you very much. I I have my bye bye.